Righto, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dave Wilson. I'm the Projects and Development Manager here at Council. One of the, I see everyone knows I do the things like the major projects and all those sort of things. I've got this week. No, I've got it working. Um, what a lot of people don't know is actually one of the major projects that we work on a lot is with wastewater here in Gisborne. Um, we're looking after the next stage for the wastewater treatment plant. So as you know, we completed the first stage of the wastewater treatment plant um, three years ago. That was the biological trickling filter system that was put in, the $40 million upgrade there. What a lot of people don't know is there's actually a second phase that comes in after that that I've been fortunate enough to be working with the wastewater technical advisory group on. And we're looking at the further options for cleaning up the wastewater post the biotrickling filter, which we'll call the BTF. Um, so we're working on that at the moment. What I'm going to do present to you is the whole system as a whole, and hopefully it'll make sense to you all. Um, we've been sitting here for a while now, so I'm conscious you're probably getting a little bit restless, and truth be told, I could talk about this all night. So I have cut it down to about 10 minutes, so there's a lot of detail that sits in behind everything we've got up here. The technical advisory group um, attest to that for the amount of time that we spend talking about wastewater. I'll start with the reticulation system first. So we know that when we have a heavy rainfall event here in Gisborne, our system can't cope. When I talk about our system, I'm talking about our stormwater system and our wastewater network. So this here is what happens when we get a heavy rainfall event. If you just want to start that video, do you want to kill the sound of that? So it's got the sound of us squelching around in our um, gum boots, which I'm sure you don't really want to hear as we walk through. But this is what this, the problem starts to look like. So you hear about people's properties backing up and flooding and all of those sort of things. So I want to talk you through what the actual problem is. As you can see here when the guys are out walking around, you can see how big this lake is that's developed um, in these people's backyard here. So this is, um, this is the problem. This is what it is um, on the ground when the guys go out. It's from the last event in August. As you can see, this lake goes all through the back of this property, but it also goes through the adjoining four properties as well. Now this was after the peak of the rain when the guys were actually able to get out, so the water's actually come down a little bit. You can see how big it is, it's going right around all of those properties there. And it's ponding, and when the ponding level comes up, you've all got gully traps if you're connected to the stormwater system, uh, to the network here in Gisborne. Those gully traps are where your sewage goes down and into the sewage network. Now, that there is a gully trap that's taking all of that storm water that's on those four properties, that big lay, was draining through that one little gully trap there. So you imagine the catchment of the roofs of all of those four houses, it's going down and into that lay, and you can see, you can see how big it is behind me, and going through that one little gully trap and into our wastewater network. So we have a couple of networks, we've got our wastewater one, that's your sewage, that's the toilet, all the things you shed your house, that's supposed to go in there. Then we've also got the rainwater network, which is your stormwater, that puts the stuff out into the gutters, um, into the streams, and manages it better. So that's your rainfall off the roofs. That's designed to take it. The problem we have is when that rainfall gets into our pipes. There's far more water going to the pipes than should be. Our pipes on a night like tonight, they're handling the, pro they're handling the water flow, no problem. Everything's making it to the treatment plant. Pipe click. Can I get back? This is what happens when too much of that rainwater comes in. We can show you heaps of really nasty photos if you want to, but I have cut it down um, so that we don't have too many. This is the exact problem here. The system gets inundated with all that rainwater going in it. This here's raw sewage coming up that gully trap and underneath those people's houses. So you've got raw sewage sitting under people's houses. If you're really unfortunate, you can also have raw sewage coming back up through the toilets as well and into people's houses. The only solution we have is to open the scales at the moment to relieve the pressure on that system. Now one of the things you'll notice that I'm doing is I'm showing you everything. This is the problem right here. This is it. That there is a scale being opened. We took that. That's just down by the Gladstone Road Bridge. So that's the water going through. That's what it looks like. We don't find that acceptable either. We're not happy with it. None of us as staff, we all swim, we all surf. We're not that comfortable with it going into the water either. So it's with a heavy heart that we have to do that as well. But that's the other option. So this is the current option that we have at the moment. Council's committed $28 million in this 10-year plan to fixing that problem. Now, 
One of the things that we have started to look at is the wastewater technical advisory groups being put in pressure on council. We've been putting pressure on ourselves as well. How can we actually do this better? Why are we still having the problems that we're having as this project's going along? Here is a perfect example of why we have the problem that we do another one here. So see, here's the gully trap here. That there is going straight up to the gutter. There's one, two, three, four. That one there, we're assuming, goes into as well. So you've got the whole rainfall that's hitting that roof going down through those 150mm pipes and into our sewage network. So this here is that same house in the bottom corner here. There's the network running either side of it. So it could be connected into, but it hasn't been. Now there's a multitude of reasons for why these haven't been connected in. And it is as simple as the downpipe just goes straight to the gully trap like that. Now we've been through and we've looked at houses, we've taken um, the stormwater um, downpipes out, they're finding their way back in again. And it's not people being, I'd like to think it's not people being malicious, I think it's people not knowing the consequence of what they're actually doing. Um, and it's an ignorance that our system just can simply not cope with this. So there's the direct inflow of people's downpipes going into our pipes. Now this here is one of the um, pictures from inside your pipe that runs from your house out to our um, main line that runs through the streets. That nice clear water that's coming into our sewage network is obviously far too clean to be sewage. What that is is people have got what we call a lateral which runs from your house through and out to the street. Now actually you own that as a property owner out to your boundary and it's your duty to maintain that part of it. And I'll come back to that in a second. What happens is we've got crack pipes as well, <coughs> we're going through our system to fix those and that's what our $28 million is focused on, is looking at upgrading the network, trying to get things fixed up. But what we've got is these crack pipes that are letting a whole lot of water in and that's infiltration coming through the ground when it rains and that's coming into our system as well. So the problem's twofold, we've got direct inflow off the roof and then we've got people's pipes cracking and those sort of things which is letting water come in through the soil as it drains. So the next third part of it which is a bit of a problem is actually what goes through your pipes. Now you're correct, we've had people putting a whole lot of um, substances into the network that should not go into the network. That's <coughs> illegal by its very nature. We're trying to trace those back and find out who's dumping those sort of things and that's an um, ongoing pollution control response we've got that, that we're trying to chase those things up and find the pe people who are doing it and prosecute where possible. The other thing we have is stuff making it into our drains that are literally just blocking it up top left hand corner that is a fat deposit so what's happening is stuff's getting going down the drains and it's building up in a building up fats clogging up the drain as you can imagine when it gets to a bend bigger and bigger and bigger you find out when it blocks up and all backs through because the sheer volume goes through the roof you can see the debris down in the bottom left hand corner we should not have bricks in our sewage network they shouldn't be finding their way in there um, <laughs> um, top left hand corner that is yet another fat deposit um, of too much fat going down through the drains in the local area um, part of this is us working with local property owners working with shops those sort of things to make sure that things like fats aren't going down the pipes because yes it goes away from your house but if you're putting a large amount down there that you shouldn't be it'll flow away until the water gets cold and then it'll go hard normally when it gets to our network we have these blockages which become a huge big problem when the system gets inundated. Down here in the corner here, that there is actually one of our sucker trucks after it's been through and su um, sucked out a um, stormwater sump, uh, sorry a sump, <coughs> that debris down in that corner, that shouldn't be in there, that's what's blocking them up so that the water can't get through, so that's the amount of material that's clogging it up down in the bottom there. <coughs> I know there's a lot of words on the slide behind me and I hate putting this many words on a slide. Um, what we're trying to get across is there's a law of diminishing returns and there's been a whole lot of studies done. We can upgrade our network and we get a, um, we get a return from that that means we can cope with this much more water. When we start getting the private property infiltration and inflow fixed, that's when we start to see it. And it's pretty simple. You think of all the roofs in Gisborne, if you take a couple of hundred of those, when we get a good hundred mil downpour over a few hours going directly into our system, our pipes cannot cope. They're not built with that. They're not built to withstand that sort of inflow. They're built to deal with sewage. So 
we have to start looking at how we're going to get that water out because either we can just keep building bigger and bigger pipes out on the road or we can actually go back to where the problem is and actually start sorting it out before it gets into the pipe because if we build really big pipes we're going to have a problem once it gets to the wastewater treatment plant and treating a whole lot of water that's actually rainwater and those sort of things so we've really got to start looking at the problem so quite rightly you're going to say so what are you guys doing about it so this is where we are starting to refocus the way that we're looking at inflow and infiltration as a project. We need to start looking at properties and what's coming in. We have problem areas around the town. We know that there are areas that we get inundated from. The, house, the video that I showed you, the four houses ponding into a gully trap, we need to fix that. Um, so part of our approach is going to be working with the community because this is a community problem, this is an issue that we all need to fix and we all need to work on the solution for. So we're going to spend the next few months going through our strategy for how are we actually going to do this, how can we work with property owners to identify uh, problem areas where we can get some return for the amount of water going through, how can we actually work with property owners on solutions. Um, some things are really simple for us. Have a look and see where your um, downpipes are going into. Are they going into the gully trips, for example? You may not have done it, but the previous homeowner may have done it when they owned the property. Um, we've had a staff member who has had that turned up and realised that all the water works were going in the wrong place. They've gone through and fixed it themselves because they knew it was their problem. Um, if we can reduce the amount of water that's making it into the network, then we have a huge start on actually being able to fix and stop those scours having to be opened. One of the things we are looking at strategically is, like I said, when we open the scours, it's because we don't have any other option. People's houses are backing up. We're looking at the, the processes that we put in place about which scours we open when and where to try and make sure as least amount of waste wastewater goes into the rivers as possible. That's a real thing that we know we take wholeheartedly. We need to try and get as little into the river as possible going forward, and that's something that we're really trying to do. So. I know I'm on a whistle stop tour of this and this is a far bigger issue that needs a lot of um, time and effort put into it before we can give you the detailed responses to what we're proposing to do with our inflow and infiltration program but that's sort of where we're sitting at the moment. Um, one of the main things is getting the proper water going through the proper pipes um, and when it does it comes to Bank Street which is of course our treatment plant. We need to make sure that we've got the right stuff coming in so that we can manage it once against the Bank Street. Now, if I can jump from here to what the Wastewater Technical Advisory Group's been doing and start talking about what we're trying to do to clean up the bay as well and actually clean up our wastewater. So, as it stands at the moment, and the, we have a system at Bank Street where the domestic wastewater comes in, it goes through what's best described as a series of sieves. We take the solids out, we take the grit out. Um, and that's trucked away to landfill. It then goes through our biological trickling filter, which works fantastically. It works exactly as it was designed and does everything that it was supposed to do. So there are a whole lot of things that it's removing um, through bugs, eating bugs, and all of those sort of things, which is quite a long explanation, but I can come and have a chat to me if you want me to try and explain it to you. Um, and then it goes out to the marine environment, um, 1.8k offshore. The Wastewater Technical Advisory Group has been working for the last three years on what do we do after the biological tripling filter. So as part of our resource consent, there's some further treatment options that need to be put into place. Now, what those treatment options are depend on where the wastewater ends up. So there's a very complicated matrix of how we got to the decision and where we did. Um, but one of the things that we've talked about and the previous presenters have touched on that is yes we've got wastewater, so we come through the screens, we've got the tripling filter. What the wastewater technical, technical advisory group is saying, okay, so how do we further treat that wastewater so that one, we can get some of the beneficial reuse because there is a heavy nutrient load, as Dr Joy has pointed out, there um, are materials in there that actually are beneficial. We've heard about the um, pressures that we have on our water as a resource, as a community. What can we do to clean that wastewater so we can get some of that beneficial reuse back? Quickly, some of the steps that we're looking and talking about is biosolids, so that's your sludge that comes out of the BTF. What can be done with that? That can be composted, a whole lot of other reuses for that. Element management, contaminant management, pathogen management. They're the big gnarly bits to be perfectly honest with you and people with brains the size of planets are helping us to overcome those things. So that's talking about how do we get things like um, 
Mercury, the pathogens, the viruses, how do we actually control those things so that we actually have a resource that's left at the end of this process that we're talking about? <coughs> One of the things that the Technical Advisory Group reported back to Council a couple of months ago now um, was developing up something that can do that quite naturally. And this is the wetlands that you will have seen presented in the paper. Now, wetlands are not the silver bullet, they're not going to fix it, there's a few more, far more technical things that need to be done and developed up as part of that. So one of the things that we're working on as, as a group is what can we do with these wetlands. So simply, wastewater goes in, the plants have the roots coming down, they're cleaning it, they're feeding off a lot of the nutrients, they're able to uptake things out, depending on what species we use and those sort of things, they can also <coughs> reduce, remove things like heavy metals, um, depending on the configuration of plants and all of those sort of things. As you can see, um, top right hand corner, you can do them on a really big scale and they're really useful. So with things like viruses, depending on how long we can hold them and retain them within our system, they can be dead by the time they come out the other end. So by being able to hold them, put them through the system, the viruses won't be alive by the end of it, those sort of things. Um, a whole lot of science goes in behind that. The reason I have the picture on the bottom left hand corner as Judy likes to remind me, once this is finished and I've told her how fantastic it's going to be, <coughs> Bruce, don't you smile, because you'll be drinking it as well. We have to be trying to get it to a level that we feel safe enough to be able to drink it. So that's a constant sort of loose hanging just about here. <laughs> this here is what we're sort of proposing, and I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about it, of course, because it is super complex. Um, this is the sort of system where you take solids out through one tank here, um, you then flow it through a whole different range, a myriad of um, wetlands, um, filters, bark filters, a whole lot of things, and you end up with a big retention pond here where you have sun, um, air flowing over it, those sort of things, and you end up with um, a far cleaner water than what we did at the start, because you've got the solids out, you've killed a whole lot of things as it's gone through, so you have cleaner water that can be used as a resource at the end. Now one of the things the technical advisory group has said, was said that the water will go to an environment. We're looking at seeing what it could be discharged to, whether it could be land, <coughs> aquifer recharge, um, to a riverway or to an outfall again. We don't know. Those are the things that we're going to work on going forward. So, when did we do this, Tina? About nine, <coughs> ten months ago? Students from, months yeah. <laughs> Students from the Wananga came down and Tina and Midge have been fantastic at helping and working with us on this project. So we've already got a trial down at the wastewater treatment plant where we planted, we put a big tank in and we planted it with um, grasses to see how they would grow. They did. Um, quite well. They grow like topsy. Um, there's a whole lot of um, bugs, a whole lot of things that have actually started to grow within that little wetland. The roots from those go down just as deep as they are high and we've pruned those once already so they're growing really well down there. 